Maybe that mic is there? Oh, yeah. Now it's working. Okay. If we could get everybody to settle down, so the usual rambunctious South African crowd, uh, if you could, yeah, take your seats and settle down so we could get moving. We're a little bit behind schedule, slightly. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're now, so we started with our advanced economy panel, uh, and now we are uh, shifting or pivoting to more of, of an emerging markets discussion. Uh, after lunch, there will be a, uh, an extended panel on emerging markets, but um, we are, are uh, uh, getting our shift going with um, a presentation by uh, Atif Mian, who is the Professor of Economics, Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. Uh, he's going to do a presentation uh, looking at work he's done with some co-authors on the role of global finance in emerging markets growth. We'll have the presentation and then we'll open it up for questions and then we'll try to finish in good order so that uh, uh, people can have lunch. Uh, some, some people in the front row look kind of hungry. So, Atif, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chris, and thank you, Reserve Bank of South Africa, for the inviting me. In the uh, first session, we've already heard of uh, 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 some of the critical events uh, post-COVID crisis, the rise of inflation, and obviously along with it, the tightening uh, of monetary policy with the rising interest rates. I'm going to pivot to the implications of that, first of all, for emerging markets, uh, which have, or some of those countries, um, have suffered as a result of monetary policy tightening. You can see that in countries like Zambia and Ghana in Africa, countries like Pakistan elsewhere, um, where we see uh, the tightening of monetary policy has had a negative impact on these uh, economies and through the financial channel um, because of their exposure to what is sometimes referred to as the global financial cycle. So that's the broader question that I'm going to be talking about. However, the typical way we talk about the question of global financial cycle and emerging markets is from the perspective of its cyclical component, and hence the macroprudential implications of that. Uh, for example, one might ask this question and say, what can we do to control the boom-bust cycles that we see in order to manage the cycle, so to speak. The angle I'm going to take today, however, is going to be slightly different from that. If we can pull up to the, and that's in the title of my presentation as well, the angle I'm going to take um, is to think about the implication of global finance, not just for the cyclical component in emerging markets, but more importantly, its implication for long-run growth. Now, it's sort of obvious that growth is a lot more important from any cyclical dimension that we might care about. Obviously, the cyclical dimension is also important, but growth in the long run is everything, as uh, all economists know. And of course, the two are linked, so that's not to say that one uh, is to the exclusion of the other, but uh, my focus is going to be about the connections between global finance and growth. This is joint ongoing work with Abhijit Banerjee um, at MIT, and I'm going to first motivate this question by quickly going through some important trends since 1980. So over the last four to five decades, there have been uh, quite obvious but important trends that link global finance and growth, apparently, and I want to investigate that a bit further. So I'm going to start by talking about two broad trends. The first one is what I'm going to refer to as the rise in global finance, and the second one is convergence in productivity levels across countries. And then I'm going to raise the question, are these two connected or linked in, at, a, at a deeper level in terms of the underlying economics? So let's start with the first 
piece of uh, evidence, which is the rise in finance. And we can start by looking at the quantity dimension of finance. So here I'm showing you two plots. The first one is a famous measure of capital account liberalization, the Chindanito Index. And what that shows is that from 1980 onwards, there has been this widespread uh, expansion or liberalization of global credit. Uh, whichever way you look at it, you see this picture that countries, by and large, this is the breakup of the Bretton Woods and so on, unleashes these global events that, uh, for different reasons perhaps, but over time, more and more countries are breaking down barriers to allow greater mobility of capital. On the right, you're seeing another implication of that, which is that you actually see a lot more cross-border flows. So this is sometimes referred to as the global saving glut as well, but here I'm simply adding up the current account deficits in, on one side and the current account surpluses of countries every year, and you can see that the magnitude, that in some sense is the magnitude of the net flows cross borders, and that magnitude has continued to rise over this time period before leveling off around the Great Recession. Um, so this is the quantity dimension of global finance. As the second obviously important dimension is price of global finance. Have prices deregulated as well, and again, uh, there is one way of looking at it, which is through exchange rates. Um, those have been deregulating as well, and so prices are passing through cross-border in a much more flexible way today than they did before 1980. Again, these are slow-moving but very persistent processes happening, and sometimes, like that famous example of the frog boiling without recognizing it, uh, we don't pay enough attention to these slow-moving but very persistent forces. So at some level, I'm going to try and bring back that attention to these uh, slow-moving events over the last four or five decades. And again, these two charts illustrates the, illustrate uh, through the exchange rate dimension that A, exchange rates have become a lot more flexible, and B, one consequence of that is you can see on the graph on the right, this is sometimes referred to as the famous Musa puzzle, um, that the volatility in exchange in, in, in real exchange rate has actually gone up uh, since 1980, um, orders of magnitude higher than what it used to be. Um, so both quantity and price have followed this trend over time. And one implication, if you will, of these two trends on quantity and price margin uh, first is that there has been this greater financialization of the world. Again, there are many different ways of looking at it. A lot of my ongoing research is on this broader issue. Today, I'm just going to focus on the global dimension of that, which is this cross-border flows, if you will. But it has, I just want to highlight that there is a sort of a even more broad-based evolution or financialization of the world. And this picture that I like a lot summarizes this, which is total credit to GDP. This is at, at the global level. Uh, and for every dollar that the global economy produces, it is now uh, uh, holding a lot more debt for the same dollar of income compared to the 1980s. So this is what I'm referring to as broader, this, this notion of financialization of the world. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? That's something I want to think uh, a little bit more carefully about today. A second implication of this globalization of finance is, um, and, and this is sometimes referred to as the global financial cycle or global financial cycle factor as well, following up uh, on the famous work by Alain Ray. Um, what this is basically capturing is the first principal component of asset prices. Again, you can construct it in different ways. You can, uh, there's an analogous quantity measure as well, the first principal component of capital flows across countries. But this is perhaps the most common one and the most intuitive one, which is it's capturing the first principal component of movement in asset prices. So the way to think of this is that this is the common component that, is, that moves asset prices together uh, in a synchronous way around the world. And you can see these ups and downs, these global cycles, if you will. The Great Recession, it dips down, then there is a boom, credit boom before that, which happens, there is a common element to that, 
and that common element has become more and more important, right? Because of, again, the earlier trends that I showed you. So that's the first piece of slow-moving uh, evidence that uh, I want to keep at the back of our minds. The second one, as I mentioned earlier, is this phenomena of convergence. And again, different ways of summarizing it. Here's one way of summarizing it, which is that the share of global GDP that belong to what I'm going to be classifying as less developed uh, uh, countries as of 1980s. I want to obviously fix my definition as of the base period here, which I'm going to take as 1980, just for illustration. Um, and you can see that the share of global GDP that belongs to those uh, less developed countries as of 1980 has increased significantly. It's quite a transition that we have seen globally take place. So rise in global finance and rise in convergence across the world. One would be tempted to say that the two are connected in perhaps a causal way and a positively causal way, right? So that's the question I want to investigate. Is that the case or not? So that's going to be the focus of my conversation today. Let me just give you kind of the punchline up front. I don't like surprises. It's actually very hard to find evidence to support this particular view, which by the way is very common in most of the models that we tend to write down. The standard traditional macro models of growth and finance, especially in an international context, would suggest that better access to international credit of the sort that we have seen over time is good for growth, that it's conducive for growth, that it facilitates capital creation and investment, which are the ultimate drivers of growth, as we all know. But if we, what I'm going to explore today is using very simple, basic, just co co correlations across the world, that it's actually very hard to argue that point forcefully. It's hard to convince ourselves that global finance has actually contributed in a meaningful way towards global growth. So I know it's a strong statement, and I want to caveat my statements by saying that the kind of evidence we can bring to bear on these kinds of issues, almost by the nature of the question, has to be suggestive at best, because you know we don't have the luxury of having very tightly identified natural experiments where one country is randomly changing its access to global finance. Of course, that doesn't happen, number one. Number two, the world that we live in is extremely nuanced and colored in different ways. And so we have to be very careful, and so I want to be mindful of that. But having said that, um, when one tries to look at uh, uh, the data in a deliberative, careful manner, in my view, it's fair to say that it is difficult to find very strong evidence of a po positive link between the rise in global finance and the rise in growth that we have seen. In fact, I'm going to show you some evidence that suggests the opposite, which is to say that unbridled access to international capital can in fact be dangerous for growth in terms of having a negative impact on growth. Now, impact, I wouldn't be able to prove it in a causal sense for those of you who really care about uh, 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 those kind of issues. But again, I think the evidence is suggestive of the statement that you're seeing on the slide. Now, what that suggests is that we need a more careful attitude towards finance. And I like to think of finance for all, many other reasons as well, which are going to be beyond the scope of my conversation here today, but a lot of it related to the earlier work that I've done, that finance actually is a two-edged sword, and we must understand both sides of that sword to be able to wield it in a constructive way for the society overall. And I'll talk more about it towards the end um, uh, when I get there. And so I'll, I want to end on what does all of this mean for policy, for countries like the African countries that uh, um, we, 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 we may be talking about, and I think we will be talking about the African countries more and more going forward, because one most important fact going forward is that soon one in every two newborns is going to be an African. 
And so I think the importance of Africa for growth going forward is extremely important. Uh, but at the same time, I think we must understand the role that global finance can and cannot play in that process of growth for the African countries and, of course, for the developing world at large. So that's going to be sort of the focus towards the end of my uh, discussion here. Okay, let's dive into some data. And as I said, I'm going to keep the analysis very simple. So I'm just going to run through some simple diagnostics, if you will. And uh, just one I want to highlight, um, I've already mentioned I'm going to focus on less developed countries as of 1980. Um, and I'm going to ask this question, which of these countries were successful in catching up and what role, if any, did global finance play in that? When you're doing this kind of a cross-country comparison, one question is how do you treat India and China versus very small countries like Aruba or Bahrain? Um, and so where I end up on this is I'm going to weigh countries by population, but then you get too much weight to India and China that nothing else matters. So to avoid that problem, I'm going to Windsorize those weights at the 5%. There are about 100 countries, so that means you don't give China its population weight, you give it the weight of the sixth most populous country, right? That's the way to think of it. Um, all right, so let's get going. There's a lot of important work that's been done, and I'm going to be absorbing that in what I'm presenting today, which is that I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'll be very careful uh, not to say things that are not consistent with what other people have already found, uh, because as I said, this work it's very hard to say my identification is really the best and other people haven't done it properly. That would be completely wrong. Uh, so I do want to pay a lot of respect to the, uh, and, and I'll point some of these papers out as, as, I, as I go along. And of course, this list by no means is exhaustive. It's just illustrative of, of some of the work that's been done. Um, okay, so I'm going to start by looking at volatility and asking the question of, is there a link between volatility and growth in general, and in particular volatility caused by the global financial cycle that I've already shown you one graph, uh, that it can be important. Um, and I'm very deliberately focusing on the second moment first. Um, the reason is that partly because of the results we're going to get, but also if you think about the level of growth, depends on how much investment a country has, and volatility or uncertainty about the future is a very important direct uh, input into whether you want to invest or not. Like one of the first questions, if you're especially long-run investment that really matters for growth. Um, if you think an environment is very volatile, you naturally will hesitate to make those long-run investments. And so that's why I think looking at volatility is a natural place to begin. And then, of course, I'm going to be looking at the level of capital flows as well um, as I move on. Okay, so here's the first, this is just raw data, and I'm averaging growth from 1980 to 2019. I'm always going to be doing that, so looking at the long-run trajectory over these four decades. And I'm showing you growth for each country on the y-axis and the volatility, the variance of that growth, variance on, of the annual growth for each country. You measure that and that's the x-axis. And you can see already visually, this is just raw data, the negative correlation between the two. Countries that are more volatile end up having lower long-run growth over these uh, four decades. Now, if you want to link this picture to this typical cyclical macroprudential question, one way you can sort of interpret this graph is to say, look, it's, it feels or it seems that it is important to manage the cycles well. Because if you are less volatile in response to cycles, you tend to grow faster in the long run. Like there is a real dividend, a growth dividend, if you will, of managing the business cycle properly. And I think that should be the rallying cry for policymakers, because that's their job, whether you are in a central bank or whether you are in the treasury, we're using fiscal policy to, to manage the cycle or using the monetary policy tools to manage the cycle. I think one thing we can agree on is that that job is extremely important and useful, and we must do more of these conferences as a result of that. Um, 
But let me now ask the question which is more relevant for the topic of my talk, which is, is or does this link have anything to do with global finance? So here's what I'm going to do to get at that question. If you go back to your Statistics 101, there's always a simple variance decomposition we can do. This overall variance on the x-axis, I can divide it as a sum of two variances. One is the variance that I can predict using some measure of the global cycle. Remember, this is variance over time for a given country. So I can take the global cycle measures over time and I can predict how much of the variance of any particular country like South Africa is predicted by these global movements in asset prices, like the global financial cycle index that I showed you in the beginning of my talk. And everything else is in the residual, and the, 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 the sum of the two represents the total, right? So that's the standard variance decomposition. I'm going to do that exact decomposition. So first, column one is just confirming the graph that I showed you, which is the negative correlation between long-run growth, which is on the y-axis, so that's the dependent variable over these four decades, and variance or volatility. Column two statistically confirms convergence. If you put initial log real GDP per capita, if you are poorer, you grow at a much faster pace. That's good news. That's why this era is so important. Um, and this negative correlation that I showed you remains there as strongly as in the raw data, even once you condition on the initial income per capita. That is to say, whether you are starting off as a rich country, uh, as a poor country, or relatively better off, it is volatility hurts you in either case, right? That's another way of thinking about that. So now let's to do the decomposition. So I'm going to decompose the first row into the last two rows. The component of variance that coming, that's coming from the global financial cycle and the residual variance. And what you can see is, so first column four is using the share of the variance that coming from global financial cycle as um, an explanatory variable. And you can see that that share of variance also comes in significantly and comes in with a negative sign. What that is telling you is that if you take two countries that both have equal overall variance, overall volatility, but one of them has a larger fraction of its overall volatility coming from the global financial cycle, that country will do even worse in terms of its long-run growth uh, realization. Okay, to say it differently, two volatilities are not the same. The volatility that is driven by global financial cycle is a lot more costly for growth, as opposed to volatility that might be a result of idiosyncratic country-specific factors. We are going to see this result, perhaps even more transparently, in column five, where, again, as I said, I'm splitting those two variances in the last two rows of column five. And you can see, you can compare the magnitude of those coefficients, minus 0.18 versus minus 0.026. You can see that the magnitude of the coefficient on variance from the global financial cycle is roughly six times. So that's the sense in which volatility due to global financial cycle is a lot more relevant or important for long-run growth, okay? So keep that thought at the back of your minds, and now I'm going to go and construct a second way of thinking about volatility and the global financial cycle. And this way should be very familiar, especially to finance students in the audience. We all know CAPM beta, which is our measure of how exposed a stock might be to fluctuations in the aggregate market. So I'm going to use exactly the same analogy but apply it to the question at hand. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to construct a beta 
which is on the x-axis. You're seeing that right here. This is the beta or the sensitivity of annual growth of a country, let's say South Africa. You regress annual growth of South Africa on this aggregate global measure, the global financial cycle. Are global markets moving up or down in that particular year? So that beta is that time series correlation or sensitivity of South African GDP growth to the global factor. So you do that for every country. That's the x-axis. And again, you just put the same y-axis, which is growth for all those countries in question over the 40 years, and you correlate the two. Nothing more sophisticated than that. Once again, you see a negative and statistically significant relationship. This is column one, is representing or summarizing that relationship uh, between the two. Now, you can, or you should be raising some obvious questions. Is it because some countries are poorer and so they are more exposed, or do they are weaker in some fundamental sense? So to try to tease those things apart as best as we can remember, the, you know, it's hard to be very precise in identification here, but let's throw in, in column two, the initial level of capital, which we know is very important for growth. It raises the R square significantly in column two, but notice more importantly, the coefficient on this beta does not change at all. So this beta is capturing a different channel, if you will, uh, that's feeding into growth. Um, Column three is doing something more to again see if there is something spurious, if you will, by putting in one very important sort of fundamental of an economy, which is its rate of investment. So it's putting in the average investment rate over the same 40 years on the right-hand side. It comes in with the sign you would expect, more investment leads to higher growth. But importantly for us, the coefficient on beta is not changing. This is just to highlight and emphasize that this is a robust factor and fact about global growth over the last 40 years, and it enters with, if you will, the wrong sign. Exposure to global finance is not a good thing for long-run growth, and the magnitude is quite significant. Column four, for the empiricist, in the room is like the tightest way you can do it, again, given all the limitations we have, which is rather than doing this cross-country, I'm going to actually explore this question within the same country. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split each country into two periods, the first period from 1980 to 2000, and then 2000 to 2019. And I'm going to ask the following question. I'm going to re-estimate the betas over these two periods, and I'm saying, okay, I'm just going to now put change in beta within the same country on the x-axis and change in growth over these two periods within the same country, what do I get? You get, that's column five. Surprisingly, now, there is no reason for column five coefficient to be the same as column one through four coefficients, but it is, uh, or one, two, three coefficients, but it is. And that gives us a bit more confidence that there is something really there in terms of the link between how sensitive you are to the global financial cycle and what kind of growth you end up experiencing over that period. This is, again, a gra graphical representation of that within-country test that I just did, the change in beta on the x-axis and the change in growth rate over the two periods on the y-axis. Okay? All right. So, let me, this is the last test I'm going to do and then I'll open up for broader discussion. Now let me talk about not volatility but quantum of credit flow. So this goes back to the famous Lucas puzzle that many of us must have heard, which is he, uh, Bob Lucas asked the famous question, why do we actually see capital not go into poor countries at the pace and rate that, again, standard theory would predict. Instead of, I'm going to come back to that way of framing this question as well, but I'm going to frame it a bit differently. Um, 
and I'm going to frame it in the context of the famous feldstein horiaka um, uh, puzzle, uh, which is the following. Let's start with the basic accounting identity, which is that level of investment equals domestic savings plus what you borrow from abroad. So just in terms of signing convention, I'm going to sign current account deficit positively, right? Because they are borrowing from abroad. Uh, that's an accounting identity, nothing, nothing to say about that. That's going to be true by definition. What Felsi Haryaka said was, they said, look, if we truly believe in this frictionless perfect market world, the sensitivity between, the, or the correlation between investment and saving should be zero. Because you have this, what is also sometimes what we have the Fisher separation theorem, which is your level of investment should just be guided by your productivity, regardless of domestic saving, you just borrow or lend to the rest of the world given to finance any deficit or give out any surplus you may have. When they famously ran that regression of correlating I and S, they find they are very strongly correlated, almost perfectly correlated, instead of correlation of zero. I'm going to do exactly that. Instead, I'm not going to focus on S, because I think it's kind of interesting. I'm going to correlate investment with current account deficit. Under perfect integrated market hypothesis, what would you expect? You'll expect a coefficient of plus one. Right? Again, because of the Fisher separation theorem, which another way of thinking about this is that, you know, how much you borrow or lend on the margin is entirely driving your investment. So the marginal investment or lender is always the rest of the world, right? That's the intuition. It's a very fundamental intuition. Is that true? Well, if that intuition is true, you should expect a coefficient of plus one. Guess what? When you run this regression, the not only is the coefficient not plus one, it's completely the opposite. It's minus one. What does that mean? What is it trying to tell us? So let me first show you that coefficient. That coefficient is minus one. In the interest of time, let me just skip uh, up to column six. What's going on here? Well, investment, if you think of investment as being determined by a country's fundamentals, some countries have poorer institutions, so they have lower levels of investment. So that's what some, that's I'm hypothesizing. That might generate variation in the levels of investment. Country with stronger institutions will have higher investment, other countries will have lower investment. Imagine for a moment that what's going on is that countries that have weaker institutions also have governments that are willing to take shortcuts and that are willing to borrow internationally to just plug their consumption deficits. Like the famous one would be if you're running a, 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 a budget deficit, you are not raising domestic resources enough, so you just go internationally and you pledge your broader public collateral. There's an obvious moral hazard there, and you plug it in. If this is a story that's operating in the background, I'm just going to call that government moral hazard story you will get the coefficient that is negative and perhaps even minus one, okay? And the data actually looks very consistent with that. In fact, if you now run the Lucas regression, which is column seven through 10, now I'm on the left-hand side, I'm putting growth and I'm estimating its correlation with flows. The column seven is the sort of the famous Lucas observation, which is current account flows are not correlated with growth. You would expect a very strong correlation, it's not. What is actually interesting, and this really has been pointed out in, in uh, a, a, a very nice recent paper by uh, Sabnam and co-authors, where they split current account into public flows, borrowing or lending by the government versus private sector. And it turns out that it's the private sector flows are correlated the right way. Again, the sign convention is positive means you borrow more. If the private sector borrows more, that's positively correlated with government. It's really the public sector that gives you that negative correlation, okay? So I think there is a broader message here, and I'm going to try to come back to it, which is developing countries, they need better public management of their exposure 
to the global financial cycle. And I'll talk a bit more about what that means. Uh, I want to show you this correlation between private and public flows in the cross-section. And I think there are these two quadrants of this graph that are saying two different things in my view. And I want to point that out, because those are the two policy implications that I'm going to end on. The first one is the column where you see China. That is, if you're running, if you're borrowing, so a positive number means you're borrowing. If you're pri and the private sector is on the y-axis, public government sector is on the x-axis. If your private sector is borrowing net, countries like China, they are running a surplus on the public side. That is to say, they are lending to the rest of the world. I think that's an important lesson for developing countries. If you're seeing a lot of private inflows, that's good. Let them finance and so on. But try to insure against the global financial cycle by then counterbalancing that on the reserve dimension. Most of it is driven by reserves, by the way. You can see that in the data. So you must counteract, or you should try to counteract strong private sector inflows, not try to stop them unnecessarily, because they might be good. They might be doing good things. But it has this negative implication. If you are OECD country, by the way, none of this, I didn't have time to talk, all of this is, does not hold true for OECD countries. Because they, they have different ways of managing. You know, it's, we kind of can make sense of it. But the world is different if you are a poorer country. It's very important to understand that fact about global financial markets. Brazil cannot pretend to be the US. And so it must react differently to global events and global cycles. So I'm going to refer to that as the insurance principle. That if you are getting a lot of private inflows, you insure against it by reducing your net exposure, by building reserves against that. This quadrant where you're seeing countries like Haiti and Ethiopia is what I will refer to as the lack of fiscal discipline quadrant. Countries here, private capital is not wanting to go to those countries. So they have, this is what I meant by, they have fundamental institutional problems. And they are doubling down on those problems by borrowing as much externally as they can. Because they are perhaps myopic, all of the usual stuff. We need to improve the discipline and obviously the institutional quality of those countries. But those are the two ways. I think the good news coming out of this is that most of the things we can manage through the public sector. So there is a role, a very important role for policy. So I'm going to, I know I'm uh, running out of time, I'm going to end on that broad message. The main facts are laid out, I've already talked about those. Finance is a two-edged sword. And I think it's fair to say that it's hard to find evidence that global finance has had a material positive role in this beautiful story, which is the story of convergence. Because remember what it means in the, at the back, it's, it means raising millions, hundreds of millions, if not billions of people out of poverty and so on. A huge success. But I don't think you can say, well, that's due to finance. I think it would be wrong to say that. What, and I think actually, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Let me just try to close on that. It made, makes perfect sense because think of what economic insight tells us about the process of growth. It's all about productivity, and real investment. It's about enhancing productivity, growth, and real investment. There are no shortcuts to that. This notion that if you could only borrow more, you will grow more, is just misplaced. I think understanding what, if you cannot borrow, there is a reason why you cannot borrow. And trying to understand and alleviating those constraints by focusing on the reasons you may be unable to borrow. Well, why is it that nobody trusts you? That's an important question. But don't try to throw money at the problem. And global finance is sometimes willing, for example, if a sovereign government is willing to put its public balance sheet, which is to say it's borrowing on behalf of its power to tax in the future. Well, that's a moral hazard problem. And I think global finance is willing to go in that direction, but that doesn't mean it's a useful thing for the country to do. But then there are other very important insights, like there are important externalities. There are pecuniary externalities, aggregate demand externalities, for those of you who have read up on the theoretical literature. 
And for those reasons, for those negative externalities, the public sector must try to react to the private inflows. This is the insurance aspect that I emphasize. I think both of these aspects are very important for developing countries to, 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 to keep in mind. Um, and I think one way to do that, I'll just end on that note, I think central banks overall, it's an incredible success story from just an institutional perspective. We have understood that it is not in the broader interest of the society to just let politicians vote every month on what the level of interest rate needs to be. So yes, we have this intermediate structure where the public appoints central bank governors and so on, but then we give them some space, we give them some discretion to focus on that narrow mandate and act appropriately. And I think by and large, they try and do their job as best as they can. I think there is reason to expand that in developing countries and add a second important dimension to roles such as central banks, which does this management of external exposure by doing those two components that I tried to highlight, the insurance component and, 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 and ensuring that there, are, there is pushback against this lack of discipline at times by going to external markets too often or too strongly. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Atif. Uh, so we can now open it up to questions. Uh, as people get their questions together, I can start with one or two. Um, so I was quite struck by the rise in global finance in your first charts and the extent to which countries dropped pegs. And I was wondering if, the, if one conclusion from that is just simply that in order for capital to achieve a certain amount of price discovery with a bunch of countries that they don't know very well, you need floating exchange rates to t send a price signal to attract capital, right? So uh, there's a kind of causal mechanism between countries as a policy option choosing to move from pegs to a floating exchange rate because that helps them to, uh, to access capital a bit better. And then another question I thought was, you know, I mean, I was a little bit worried that you might sort of suggest that global finance wasn't a good thing. And obviously the counterfactual for countries, even those that are not using capital well, must certainly be that uh, they would be far worse off if the global finance wasn't available to them. So there is some benefit on a, in a big picture way to economies that, uh, that are trying to, trying to, to develop, uh, even if that global finance is used quite badly. Um, so you might want to think, comment a little bit about that um, and whether or not that's specifically true. Sure. And there's Can a I hand in the back there. Let's take one more question and then we'll... Uh, thanks very much. It's Chris Axelson from SA Reserve Bank. The IMF changed the policy advice last year on capital management flows to say that they could have a capital management measures could be used or macro prudential measures could be used preemptively for developing economies to try and halt some of these flows. Because um, I was also wondering, like, Chris was asking what your sort of view is on these, on these flows. Like, do you agree with that IMF viewpoint on you know, preemptively trying to stop them? Um, and they did it mainly for financial stability reasons. Are you saying actually it could even be a growth reason to try and uh, pull those flows back a little? Thank you. Let's pause there. Why yes, you thank you. Those? Thank you for those questions. I'm, I'm, uh, let me start with Chris's uh, two questions. Excellent, really. The second question is really important, and I want to make sure that <laughs> the message does not go across, come across the wrong way. Uh, remember the limitation of any such analysis. You are looking at relationships on the margin. Um, and so quantum experiments, which is the one that uh, Chris um, um, w w was suggesting, which is a completely you know, shutting down the whole global finance, 
Of course, this kind of analysis will have to be thrown out the window as well. We don't know that counterfactual, so I'm not suggesting that we are worse off relative to that counterfactual, of course. And so that's why it's important not to overreact to this kind of evidence, but to react incrementally as well. And that's what I try to emphasize. There is no reason to ban private flows. Um, but I think there is a reason to be cautious about them, and we can do that. We have the tool. That's the good news, in my view, looking at the data, which is that you can, and that's why I ended by em emphasizing the role of policy. That's the good news in this analysis. I think we can do better by talking about it more uh, systematically in terms of giving people actual uh, tools that they can use. And I mentioned a couple, again, on the, those reserve management and the other one is putting an institutional arrangement that manages some of the tendencies to overstep by the political side. Again, it's a very, it's, it's, I'm not doing anything new conceptually. We already know, we have, that's why we have central banks today. Imagine we did not have central banks today and I were to stand here and say, well, there is a reason to appoint governors and so on so they could decide monetary policy. We'll say, what do you mean? Why not us, the citizens? Why not put it up to a vote every day? We understand these common uh, choice problems and we need to develop these institutions. And that's what I'm arguing that on this dimension, we need to have that policy lever to go in that direction to manage global finance in a way. So that's the real, so it's a more nuanced uh, uh, message that I want to put across, that's important. Would you add fiscal institutions to that? I mean... Now, it's a tricky thing. I, in, in a way, I already did, because <laughs> uh, I, I think at least the fiscal, uh, Chile, by the way, is a very useful example of a country that did put in place fiscal institutions as well. And it really, I think, deserves to be studied. So I think, yes, one can go in that direction as well. But I am saying the minimum on the fiscal side is at least the fiscal dimension that has implications for exposure to global. Because I think, it's, it's, and intuitively, it's very obvious why. Your exposure to the rest of the world, if you do it wrongly, is a lot more costly than your domestic, and, and you know, that China kind of understands that very intuitively, and that's why they've always avoided exposures outside they have done massive dislocations domestically, but they know because we have control over it, we can always tax and consolidate fiscally those risks. That's the key insight. So you can give more discretion fiscally as long as it's within that circle where you can fiscally consolidate exposed. You cannot fiscally consolidate exposed when your exposures are external. That's, again, the insight, and that's the reason why I'm stressing on this node that you, you want to have an institution protect you from yourself. That's, again, the same reason we have central banks. Um, Chris, I've forgotten your first question. What was it? <laughs> Never mind. Go on to Chris Axelson's question about, okay. about, okay. about the IMF's... Uh, the, uh, uh, the preemptive, uh, again, an excellent question. Um, I think it's a movement in the right direction for all the reasons that I talked about. Um, however, I think we need more. We need more guidance on what that means. Let me try to, I, I think there's a lot of scope for more conceptual theoretical work along with empirical work on that, but I have some ideas, again, guided by first principles, right? I think what's going on in the back of, we have to think more carefully about what finance means. What is it that you, you as a country, what is it that you are trying to do when you borrow internationally, whether to the private sector or otherwise. Um, I think fundamentally, it's not a lack of capital that you're, it's not for the lack of capital that you're going outside the world. In fact, I can't write down a model where that's the reason and you can go outside of the world. Let me give you an example. If your domestic citizens are unwilling to lend you for a high rate of return, what comparative advantage does someone saying in New York have that they can monitor you better, they can delegate better, and so on and so forth? I think it's very unlikely. So I don't believe in those arguments at all. What is more likely is that you need foreign finance because what you are really trying to import is not capital. It's actually something else. 
what you are really trying to import is technology and know-how. It could be organizational or managerial know-how. And finance is acting as a commitment device. Because people in New York who may have the technology and who may have the expertise, they want to come to your country because they know they have higher returns, but they want to make sure that they are able to benefit from whatever they, else they might do inside that country. And, you know, for example, uh, an option contract is a wonderful thing for giving those incentives. And that's what equity finance, for example, is doing. So I think that has to be very clear in the minds of the regulators that what is it that we need foreign financing for? It's not to plug in capital gaps. That old notion is completely absurd and wrong. What you're trying to do is, you, now, if you think from that perspective, again, that's the first principle, if you think from that perspective, I think the answers would come naturally, what it means to have preemptive control. And again, China intuitively has done that in its early part. China is doing things very wrong right now, so I don't want to suggest that China is the country to follow all the time. But I think their early history is actually quite useful to learn from. Because what they said was, if you look at their capital account regulation early on, starting from perfect capital controls, they op opened up. But if you notice how they opened up, they did not allow, for example, capital to come in into the real estate sector. Because it's the most boring, unproductive sector. You don't, that's not why you need external financing. Your own people should be sufficient to finance construction and all of that. You open up in the technology sector, so IT, for example, or any other manufacturing and so on. That, by the way, is another dimension of that. There's other work that I have done with uh, Emil Werner and Amir Sufi, and then uh, uh, Emil has done other work with Carson Muller, where it, it, it shows or makes this basic point, which is all finance is not the same, especially external finance. If you're financing the productive, in particular, tradable sector, it's sustainable financing because you can pay it back. Remember, when you're borrowing, you must return to the lender. But if you're borrowing for domestic, non-tradable consumption and things of that nature, there is a transfer problem you're building on top of the borrowing, which is how will you return? Because New York is not interested in buying the non-tradable goods and services in Dhaka or Johannesburg and so on. So you can only pay it back through your tradable sector. So you must preemptively prioritize capital coming into high productive, tradable, technology transfer, management transfer, those sectors, and tax discourage in other sectors. So that's just one example of what preemptive controls mean in my view. And, and it's, it's really a much broader discussion. Great. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap up because we're running late. There are two more questions. Okay, can we do it very, very quickly? My, my question was answered, so I'm happy to pass over. Okay, one, one, one last question and then we cut it. We re remember there's a panel this afternoon on emerging markets again, so you'll, okay. we can raise some of these issues there. Go ahead. Okay, happy. Um, uh, the question is with regards to the last point uh, that you made, uh, Professor Teef. Um, whether you, you mentioned how um, it would help to have another control um, in addition to, um, I guess, what we would have as the committee. What does that look like practically, especially within South Africa? We are um, just looking at our stock market, uh, sometimes being a, a pro, I guess, the GFC or being correlated to that cycle is actually beneficial for us, especially when we don't have a lot that's working on the ground. Um, so it's almost like we're taking that away. And I guess maybe just kind of uh, give us example, if you can, give us an example of in particular an emerging market that probably has decreased their correlation to that cycle and maybe that has worked um, for them, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's already something that the seeds of it are already there in most central banks, including South Africa. Obviously, reserve management is an important part of what central banks do. And a number of things I'm suggesting have to do with reserve management. I think but what needs to be done is we need to clarify in terms of the principles and objectives of how you manage, what is it that you're trying to do when you're 
managing reserves. For example, it's not just a question of how many months of import can you back with your reserves. You need to look at the correlation between your reserve buildup or lack of it and your private inflows and the nature of that private inflows. Is this short-term demandable deposit sort of private inflows that you're taking in? Or are they pledged for the longer run? Are they coming into sectors which are productive, which can generate enough capacity endogenously to pay it back? Or is it coming into more non-tradable sectors, in which case you will have a problem, this standard tra uh, uh, transfer problem, if all of a sudden there's a dry out in global liquidity and that money is pushed out uh, uh, during the downturn of a cycle, you better build up even further your reserve cushion. So I think one element of that is it's not that they, and, 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 and the financial stability board's kind of idea and mandate. The idea is already in there. The central banks are already doing things of that sort. I think it needs to be strengthened. It needs to be defined better exactly what they, so this, this, there's a science behind all of this that needs to be developed further. And those tools and principles and objectives just like we did for inflation, like, you know, the price stability, what does it mean, different ways of measuring it, uh, what should be the objective function, narrow versus broad, all of that stuff. I think along this, for the same reasons, you see, again, I, I want to emphasize the asymmetry. The US, the UK, and those countries, they do not need to worry about, Canada does not need to worry about this, by and large. This is really a developing country problem. And I think we have sort of left that question, I, I would say, us academics, I think it's, we have sort of left that question hanging out there for too long. And so there needs to be more, more work on this question for exactly the reasons your question is very legitimate, that it needs to be answered better than what I'm doing right now. So we need to spell this, these things out. That's, that's very important. Let's, con let's conclude on that, on that thought. Uh, certainly a very useful one. We are starting again at what time? 1.25, correct? Yes, very good. Thank you very much, Professor Mian. Thank you.